So as we go through the book of 1 John, we've been seeing all sorts of themes about what it is to be an authentic Christian, what it is to be real. And John doesn't stop here in chapter 4. He continues on, but he speaks specifically about false teachers that have come in. How do you know if you're authentic, if you're truly a Christian, or if someone else is truly a Christian. And of course, it's one of those discerning things that we have to be careful of and keep an eye on. Most people will say, well, you, you can't judge me, man. You know, the Bible says that. Do not judge or you too will be judged. And the same measure you use will be measured back to you. And so Jesus isn't saying that we aren't to judge and discern. What he's saying is we shouldn't think ourselves greater or better than and look down upon people. But we are called to weigh people out to see if they're authentic or not. Obviously, there are folks that you can trust. And then there are people that you can't trust. And making a difference between those two groups is hugely important because people that you spend time with actually influence you. They will actually shape you into becoming who you actually will be a finished product of. So you want to be careful of that. And so the scriptures are clear to admonish us. As we get into it here, we're going to start in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It just sounds like the simplest bit of reasoning as he goes through here to know the difference between that which is true and that which is in error. In verse 1, he begins, Beloved, which is those who are loved by God. And it's actually the word that we understand for unconditional love. And that's what he calls us by. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the question of being authentic is, is this thing or this person or this philosophy or this understanding, is it from God or is it not? In fact, miracles themselves can be from God or not. And so just because it's powerful or just because it's moving or just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's of God. It doesn't mean it's true. There are lots of people who believe things that are not true. And so we have to be careful that we don't become one of them. And even in the first century, John says, many of them have gone out from here. And so we have to understand there, not everybody who calls himself a Christian is really a Christian. And so there are those who are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so they will come in among the sheep and they will pretend to be a sheep so that they might gain an advantage. In, in the Old Testament, it's just full of Old Testament information about those who say that they're prophets of God. A prophet is someone who speaks to the people on behalf of God. Uh, just in, in case you were wondering what a prophet is, it's somebody who has a message for people from God. And uh, the, anybody who speaks to you with any sort of authority, hopefully it, it has the understanding that it has a source. It either comes from God or it comes from the devil. There's, there's either a, a holy and divine uh, battery that's going to run this thing, or it's something that's insidious and evil. And so for us to figure that out is very important. The Old Testament m makes a very specific line as to what these false teachers are doing and what their motivation is. Their teaching is flattery. They try to win people by telling them kind and nice things to win them over to become their friends. Their ambitions are financial. 
They wish to line their pockets with money. It's, about, it's not about you at all, though they may get you to think it's about you. They may, think, they may get you to think that they are your best friend, but they're just not. They're in it for the money. Number three, lives live duplicitous. They will say one thing with their mouth, and then they will live a different kind of life. They will say people should be self-sacrificing and forgiving, and yet they'll be full of bitterness, and they'll be full of selfishness. Their consciences will be dulled, where they can do things and not even feel bad about them any longer. They don't even have an understanding. It's like grass that's been walked on way too much. There's no more grass there because it's been walked on too much. And so their consciences, because it becomes offended on a regular basis, they just don't have a conscience. And their goal is deception. It's not those who are unlearned. It's not those who are ignorant and just uninformed. These folks go about insidiously trying to deceive people. And that is their goal. So that's who it's talking about. So be careful of those who go out and test the spirit. I mean, that which is behind the message that someone delivers to you. And it is something the scripture tells us to do, is to be careful of this. In Jeremiah 14, 14, And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, or spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart or the imaginations of their own feelings. And you'll, all you have to do is turn on the internet. All you have to do is look at the television. All you have to do is click on a TV and you will find all sorts of people from the imagination of their own heart and mind will try to win people over and then of course at the end they will tell you that they're financially in need that you should send them a check. Uh, I won't be doing that today, just so you know. In 2 Corinthians, Chapter 4, verse 2, the Apostle Paul gives us an example of his type of ministry, which is following Christ. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, which is selfishness and deceit, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he says, what I do is I preach Jesus Christ and who he truly is, and not something for my own self-gain. And there are people who will take the word of God, the very truth, the disclosed divine word of God, and they will take it and try to extract finances from people. It's the, the industry, the Christian industry is rife with such people, and we are supposed to look out for them as false prophets, those who do not have the Spirit, those who do not know God, they use God's Word enough, they name the name of Jesus. But the Jesus they talk about is a false Christ. He's not the real Christ, the historical real Christ. It's just Christ in name only. And so those we want to work out for and keep our eyes attentive. Jesus explains in Matthew chapter 13 the process by which people become deceived and lured away. And he gives, uh, in, in chapter 13, he gives an example of of a sower who sows seeds. He talks about tares, which are weeds. And then he talks about wheat, which is not a weed. It actually bears fruit. And he talks about how the sower comes and he sowed some seed by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured them. So the sower goes out and he throws some seed out on his field, but some of it lands on the path. And instead of being trampled, what ends up happening is the birds see it, and of course it's wide open, it's not in the soil, and it just gets pecked off. And it says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. Jesus gives an example of these four different types of soils. Uh, one isn't soil at all, it's the path. And then there's another one that's shallow. And because it has water that falls upon it, uh, the seed falls in there and it sprouts quickly, but because of the heat of the day and it has no root, it dies. And then there's another one that has thorns. And because there are thorns, what happens is the seed takes root and it begins to grow, but the thorns choke it out so that it becomes unfruitful. 
And then, of course, there's another soil in which is gives fruit. You know, you, you get all of varying degrees of fruit out of it. And that's the good soil that actually bears fruit. And, and hopefully that's a picture of our hearts, a heart that is plowed up and that is hungry to receive the seed of God's word. And so there's this process that happens to us when we hear the truth and we have a choice to receive it or not. But what happens if that message is not the truth? What happens if it's actually deceit and the devil's trying to use this to deceive us and lure us away? And you can click on any, any website and see all sorts of philosophies. If it feels good, do it. It's a, a common bumper sticker. Or the guy with the biggest toys wins. Uh, there, you'll find these philosophies everywhere. And of course, they're, they're not even worth the paper to be printed on a bumper sticker because they're no sort of uh, philosophy to live your life after. But people do. And at the end of their lives, they wonder why they wasted them. Because what you have you know, after all of that is an eternity full of being separated from God. And the things that you had that you left to people that didn't work for them uh, are going to probably squander them, at least that's what the statistics show us. And so Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 to 32, another parable he put forth to them, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which is a, a very, very small seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come to nest in its branches. It's interesting that in the same chapter, Jesus is using the analogy of this bird to be like Satan. And if the tree is so big, a mustard plant, by the way, is only about two feet high. You don't get a tree from a mustard seed. Uh, not being uh, agricultural in our background, we may not understand that, but Jesus says it's like this seed that goes in and it becomes this gigantic tree. And of course, people hearing this would say it, a mustard seed doesn't become a gigantic tree. It becomes a small bush and it's an herb, essentially. And he says the birds come and they nest in its branches, which tells me that if this church gets way too big, what's going to happen is you're going to have people here that are false prophets. You're going to have people that come in and they're going to look to snag the seed and pull it away and say, you know, don't worry about the sermon today. The Word of God really doesn't mean what it seems to say very plainly. It means something completely different. In fact, it means the opposite of what you've heard. Uh, you, you will have people that will float into churches and they will do that, looking to gain people for their own following and not following the, the Word of God. So we want to keep an eye on that because there is a process. Here again in chapter 7 of Matthew, Jesus speaking of self-deception, he says, he warns us to enter in through the narrow gate. He's talking about the path of life, the way that we live our lives. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few that find it. So Jesus saying, not everybody's going to get into heaven because it's not easy. It's, it's a small, narrow gate. It's very discriminatory, and God doesn't just take everybody. Well, we're all God's children. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're all his creation, but we're not all his children because we haven't been adopted, and that's the only way you get there. Uh, in in uh, verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. In other words, you'll know them by their behavior, what comes out of their life, not just what they say, but how they live. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He's giving an analogy of hell. And he says, therefore, a tree, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. He's speaking of false prophets. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father and who is in heaven. So it's not about what you say. It's not even about what church you attend or whether you attend a church or whether you understand uh, what the Word of God says or who Jesus is. It's whether it affects how you live. It's whether Jesus Christ is truly 
the Lord of your life, whether he's the boss, whether he's the one that you truly follow, not just in word or in a mental ascent, but an actual physical submission to. It's a very different thing. So he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and yet they're not going to make it. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. So they know the terminology. And have we not prophesied in your name, those who spoke in the name of God? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I, this is Jesus speaking, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice the common theme of somebody who's practicing lawlessness, not submitting their heart to the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. And so there'll be people who know the terminology. They will claim to have spoken in God's name, cast out demons, and done miracles. So if that's the case, then not every miracle is necessarily done by the power of God. And it's those who understand the language and call Jesus Lord don't necessarily mean it by the way they behave. And so these are the false prophets, those who claim to know him but really don't. So we need to be on top of things. And he says, test the spirits. In other words, don't accept everything that comes down the pike. Don't believe everything that you hear. Matthew 24, 23 to 25, Jesus says, and if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, even those who have been chosen by God, even his own people. See, I have told you beforehand. So Jesus gives us a heads up that this is going to happen. And if you turn on, God help me, TBN, you will find any number of preachers there just to make money. And they make far more money than anybody that they teach or take care of. They're out there to deceive those people that are rich. Send in a check and whatever malady is you have, God will heal because we will pray for you. And then there are those who uh, just completely use the poor, and there are people who send their last dollar in thinking that God's going to give them a gift if they send in money to their ministry. These are false prophets. They are ravening wolves who just shred the sheep, and they should be pointed out by name. I won't be doing that today, but uh, you know, test the spirits, as the scripture says, because there are wolves among the sheep, boys and girls, and we need to make sure that we find them. In Jude, I'm just going to go through a big chunk of Jude. It's basically the um, the gospel of the the apostates. Okay, so this is about the prophets that are fallen, that are twisted, and are preaching the word of God for their own sakes and not for God's. And this is what he says about them: For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Uh, shame on me if I don't notice people in my church that do this. But who long ago were marked out for this condemnation? Ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lewdness. In other words, because God forgives you of your sin, just send your brains out because it doesn't really matter. God will forgive you. That is a sign of a false prophet. And they deny the only Lord God our only, our, and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards, destroyed those who did not believe. He says, just an example from history, the people in Egypt who came out of Egypt, a lot of those were destroyed in the desert because they didn't believe. So don't think you've got it any easier than them. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they left their own abode where they lived in heaven, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So he says, take Egypt as an example. Those guys didn't make it. They were delivered, but they didn't make it all the way, and God destroyed them in the desert. By the way, the angels, they didn't do so great either. The ones that turned their back on him and rebelled, they got cast into utter darkness until the last day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so here's a third example of Sodom and Gomorrah. The LGBT didn't make it in Sodom and Gomorrah before it ever reached America. 
verse 8, likewise also those, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. In other words, they have no respect for anybody in authority and they don't let anybody tell them anything. Uh, they don't believe in stop signs, uh, taxes, they don't believe in red lights, they don't believe in boundaries, they don't believe in anything. They believe that whatever they want to do, they should be able to do. And sometimes they shroud it in the American dream, which is silliness. So, and yet Michael and the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But with these ev with but these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These folks have no respect for anyone in any position of authority. You can see it happening in Congress, uh, when people speak against the president or somebody else that bears a, a a different, uh, either a D or an R after their name, they'll just attack them. Don't get sucked into the stupidity. Verse 12, these are spots in your love feast, uh, literally like leprous spots on your skin. He's saying they're like cancer, okay? So you have to watch out for them. While you're having fellowship and eating together, they come in unaware and try to take advantage of you. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, which are supposed to have fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. In other words, they talk a big talk. Wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Uh, stars, by the way, always have a fixed place in the sky unless they're shooting stars and they don't have a home, which is the, his point. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all those who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers. By the way, this is sin. Just thought I'd let you know. I didn't say it. The scripture did. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. In other words, if it feels good, do it. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles and of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. So these are not well-intentioned people that are just ignorant. They have an agenda. He continues on. And second, Peter. Peter brings out a lot of the same things that Jude does. He actually does it before Jude. So you're going to see a lot of common occurrences here about those who are false prophets. And it says that they come hunting for Christians. They're not looking to convert anybody in the world. They're looking to come into the church and contaminate the gene pool. It says here in verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 2, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Now there are people that think doctrine doesn't really matter. Can't we just all get along, just love each other? Doctrine has everything to do with how you behave. What you believe and what you know dictates what you do. And if what you do and what you believe are two different things, you're called a hypocrite, and that's a heresy. So they bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. That's a concerning thing. The Lord who bought them, Jesus Christ, came to be a sacrifice, not just for us, but also of the whole world. And it says that they're, they call him Lord, and yet he's not really their Lord. And he says that they come in and they deny the Lord who bought them. They get to the place where they completely turn their back on Christianity, on Jesus Christ, and they renounce all of it. So you wonder, how can that happen? Because a wolf got to them. 
and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. If you want to see what happens to a church when somebody in the church turns their back on Jesus Christ and starts speaking Jesus down, it brings a, a smear on all of Christianity. And that's quite honestly why the world has no respect for Christians. Because they've seen people who call themselves Christians living in the most ungodly way. And so what it does is it brings blasphemy theme upon the way of truth. By, co by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains to darkness to be reserved for judgment, much like Jude said, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So don't sweat it. You're okay because God's bigger than all of this, so you don't have to worry about it and become fretful and fearful like other people do, but we're watchful. And especially those who walk according to the lust of the flesh of uncleanliness and despise authority. So those who do whatever they feel like doing and they despise authority, they don't want any restrictions. They don't want a boss telling them what to do. They don't want a government telling them what to do. They don't think their mate has a right to speak into their lives. They don't think a friend should say anything to them derogatory or negative. Those kind of people that are just shut down and they're completely self-centered, those are especially the people you want to watch out for. And those are the things I want to watch out for in my own soul to make sure that those things don't happen. So. They, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, those in authority, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring reviling accusation against them before the Lord, much like Jude, Jude said, and speak evil things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse with you in the daytime. And they are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery. It's the picture of somebody wandering around and looking for someone to take advantage of. That they cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. They are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and they've gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. You see, the target of these folks is those who call on the name of Jesus, who assemble with those who claim to be righteous because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Those who have escaped former sins and have come to some semblance of understanding who Jesus is. These are the ones that are right picking for the false prophet. Verse 19, while they promise them liberty, which is you can do whatever the heck it is you want and it's okay, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also is he brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness having, than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb that a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So the scripture says it's better 
that you've never known what it is and how pleasing it is to submit to God's laws, to be his person, to be adopted into his family, than it is to have known some understanding of that and then fall away back into the world because it gets worse. And Jesus tells another parable how there was a man who was possessed of a spirit. It's like a house that has a spirit and the unclean spirits cast out, except he comes back and the house hasn't been filled. It's just been swept clean. And he brings seven spirits worse than the first and they inhabit. And the end of that man is worse than the original. Jesus talks about how when you're just cleaned up and you're not filled up, how you become a target. And you don't want to be a target. So we always want to make sure that we fill up with the emptying out and the cleaning up. So all of these passages talking about false prophets that were to be on our toes. And I'm not sure that pastors are doing a good enough job keeping people on their toes to know this is what we've been warned of from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from Jesus, from the apostles, from Jude and from Second Peter. It's, it's all in here. And by this you know the Spirit of God. So we're going to find out how we can discern between that which is good and that which is not. And you can use this as a standard. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. So Jesus' teaching says, this is how you can tell, I'm sorry, this is uh, the Apostle John saying, this is how you can tell the difference. If people recognize Jesus Christ, you see, it's not about whether you believe there's a God, or you believe there's a spirit, or you believe that there's a set of rules, or that God created everything. That is not it. The determining factor of whether you fall off on this side eternity, on, on the fence, uh, on this side or that, is Jesus Christ. It's whether you recognize Jesus Jesus, but his last name isn't Christ, by the way. It means that he's the Messiah, which is the, the uh, Hebrew for him, the Mashiach, which means he's the one who's come to deliver us. So it's Jesus who was the Messiah. It's not Jesus, you know, your, your Spanish friend who lives down the street. This is Jesus, the Messiah, the one who was sent by God, the only begotten Son of God, as the Scriptures lay out, and exactly as Jesus has confessed who he is. That is the determining factor. So, what do you do with people that say, oh, well, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Buddha, and I believe in, I believe in everything. In fact, I believe in forces, and I believe in, in meditation, and I believe in astral projection, and I believe... Jesus isn't a spice that you add to the soup of everything else. It's either Jesus or it's not Jesus. It's just that simple. And the scriptures are really plain about it. So Jesus teaching us, it's all about him, really. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 to 46 reads this way. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, Who do you think, uh, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Jesus is referring to the Old Testament passages that we're talking about when Jesus would come. And Jesus is standing right before them and he goes, hey, what do you think about what the Old Testament says about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David, because the scripture is very clear that he would be an offspring of David's line in which Jesus was not only through his stepfather, who was Joseph, but also through his true mother, Mary. They were both related through the Davidic line. And how then, Jesus asked them, how then does David, in the Spirit, in other words, by God's Spirit, he says this, calls him Lord, which means someone's higher than me, saying, the Lord... God, Yahweh, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. He's quoting a passage from the Old Testament. And David, if David then calls him, the descendant, the Messiah, Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare ask a question of him anymore. Jesus asked them a question. How is it that David says that his own offspring is God? How do you call your own offspring God? I mean, unless you worship your kids, uh, which certainly wasn't done then, and it would be completely heinous if, if it was done or when it's done. He says, how is it that he calls him Adonai? How is it that he calls him God? He calls him Lord. How can that be? And they couldn't answer. 
Because you see, Jesus was not just a human historical figure. He wasn't just a nice Jewish boy that grew up in a nice Jewish neighborhood. He was the Messiah, born of a virgin, as God interrupted the gene pool because we're all sinners, comes in, impregnates a woman, and Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, God incarnate, man and God, 100% fully man, 100% fully God. And that is the question, do you believe in that Jesus? Not the Jesus of the historical figure, the offspring of Mary, but do you believe Jesus as he calls himself to be? If not, then you have a false Jesus. If you believe in Jesus along with every other thing that comes down the pike, then you really don't believe in Jesus. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who comes to the Father comes through me. Jesus claimed exclusivity because he's the Son of God. If you don't believe in that Jesus, then you don't have a right understanding of who Jesus is. Jesus says here again in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 16, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man? It's interesting, Jesus' favorite topic for himself was that he is the Son of Man, which means he's the offspring of man. But it's also a messiah, a messiah, a messianic title that was given to him by Daniel way back in the Old Testament. He calls himself the Son of Man. And he says, so they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. And Simon Peter answered, because he always answers for all of them, you are the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That was not a light thing to say that he was related to God. Nobody says such a thing of Jesus unless they understand that he is God, the Son. And so, and, and Jesus said, you know, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will, I will make my, I will uh, found my church. And he goes on to explain, upon this statement that he makes, this is what the church is founded upon, about who Jesus truly is. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have the Father. It's just that simple. You can't say, me and God are good, but Jesus I don't get. The, sorry, you don't have it. Because the only way to the Father is through the Son. Jesus said it exclusively. So you either believe that or you don't believe it. You can't say, I have God, but I don't have Jesus. John 14, 6, as I quoted before, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So that's an exclusive statement. So what do you say about Jesus? How... How do you place him in, in the order of things? Uh, certainly there are great teachers, there are enlightened people, uh, there are those who say incredibly uh, wise things, and yet they're not Jesus. You, nobody else would be able to die for your sins other than one who is perfect because they die for their own sins. You and I will die for our own sins. If you smoke, you'll probably die of cancer. If you drink, you'll probably get an interior disease with your blood vessels or your kidneys or your liver. You know, you, you'll die for your own sins. If you, if you live sexually immoral, you'll get an STD and it'll affect your heart. Or if you live like a fool or if, if you drive 120 miles an hour, you'll have a crash. Or, you know, we die for our own sins very much unless, uh, you know, our expiration date eventually comes and we eventually will all leave this place one way or the other. But Jesus, when he died, he did it selectively. He did it in mind to come as the Savior of the world to die for my sins. He said so. Because he was God's perfect lamb, the sacrifice that was made for you and I. And it's through faith in that sacrifice that we're adopted into his family. But more than that, it's not just an understanding, a mental ascent. It's something where Jesus comes into your life and he changes you from the inside out. You get a new heart and a new mind. You become a new person in Christ Jesus. The experience Jesus called being born again is having a spiritual birth. Not that you have an understanding of things or about who he is, but you know him experientially. That's a very different thing. So if you don't know him, I would encourage you, you can, all you have to do is ask him and he'll come. So, what do you say? 
about Jesus? Who do you say that he is? And that'll be the only question God's going to ask you when you get to heaven. Not whether you send your brains out or you did a lot of mistakes or a few mistakes, because we've all made a ton. The only difference is, have you accepted the provision for your forgiveness, which is my only son? Can you imagine being God, sending his only son to die, and then just having him snubbed all of your life, and you're going to stand before God, and he's going to say, what'd you do with my son? Can you imagine how God's going to feel at that point if you just snubbed him and you knew better? And you were told and you heard and you understood and you had enough information. He's going to play the videotape and say, why didn't you listen? It'll be that way. So, verse 4. You are of God, little children. He's doing an us and them. He's talking about them, the false prophets, and how they listen or, or, or how people will listen to them. But you are of God. God, little children, and have overcome them, meaning the false prophets and these spirits that speak, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So if you're a believer, if you truly believe in Jesus Christ and he's the Lord of your life, you don't have to worry that you're going to get deceived accidentally somehow and you're going to end up adrift. If your heart is fully committed and given over to the Lord and you've got your face in his word, there's no way it's going to happen. Because the one who is in you, by the way, it's the Spirit of God. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God does a regenerative work in your spirit, in your soul, and you become a new creature. Uh, it, it, you actually become a new species, according to the scriptures. So that's what happens. And the one that's in you is greater than the one who is outside of you. And of course, that's his territory, which is the earth, which is the devil's neighborhood. Now, whenever we want to uh, hold up under great pressure, we build things like submarines. Uh, if you've ever seen these submarines that go down into the Marianas Trench or some of those really deep places, they go down like two miles under the ocean, and there's some really funky things that live down there. But because of the incredible pressure that you would be under if you went in your body, you would just implode. It would just crush you like an egg. And so we have to go down there and build these heavy walls and go down in these submersibles. And, and it's amazing the science that they, they make these things out of. I, I just uh, always wonder if it was made by the cheapest bidder, and I, I don't know if I'd go down. But anyway. So that's what you do when you go down. But the amazing thing is that there are creatures down there who aren't walled up with steel and glass. They're thin. They're paper thin. In fact, you can't bring these creatures up or they explode because the pressure inside them is greater than the pressure outside of them. And so it's an amazing thing that God has created them to be able to live down there. And thank God they live down there and they explode when they come up. I don't want to find them wandering around when I'm at the Jersey Shore. But this is an anglerfish, which uh, you may recognize, um, made popular by Nemo. So these guys are not built up with gigantic walls and they withstand the pressure fine. What the scripture is saying, the one who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. You don't need a sub. You don't need all of these extraneous things on the outside to be able to stand up under the pressure because the one that's in you is greater than the one that's in the world. And Paul brings this uh, to light in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He's talking about our physical body. We have this spiritual treasure, this possession of ours in earthen vessels that the excellence and power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side and yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken. We're struck down but we're not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. So he's saying, we, because we know the Lord, we're going to go through a whole bunch of difficult things in this world. And you might get knocked down, but you're not going to get knocked out. Because God is the one that strengthens us from the inside. It's not about what's gone on on the outside. And if any of you have been in recovery, you understand. You want to make sure that you don't go into a place where you'd be tempted. You don't go to a place where there's going to be drugs or alcohol or whatever your particular ism is. Um, 
you just have to build up walls. You have to build up these big steel walls. Make sure you protect yourself because that's the only way you'll be able to withstand. Well, it's funny because that's not what the scripture says. It says that he who's in you is greater than it's in the world. Now, I don't want to open myself up to a place of temptation, and I certainly don't do that. But if I find myself in a place of temptation, I'm not just going to say, oh, well, that's it. I got no strength in me because I'm suddenly faced with a, you know, a challenge. That's not the deal. I'm gonna, I might get knocked down, but I'll never get knocked out. And the scripture tells me so. Because I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ because of the one who loved me. So, and it says, the one who's in the world. I just want to make a small note about Satan. Uh, there, you know that there are two extremes that you can go with the devil. Number one, you think he's everywhere and everything. He's under every bush and he's around every corner and he speaks through every one. And he's out to get you. And you can live your life that way. Or the opposite is usually what he tries to deceive people with, which is he doesn't exist. There's no devil. There's no evil. Uh, it's funny, when we talk about the Holocaust or we talk about Hitler, you know, evil is one of those things we can attest to real readily. But as soon as we start talking about reality of Satan and, and evil forces, eh, I don't think so. I don't think they exist. You know, the, all that stuff in the movies, you know, the exorcist, you know, what that does is it desensitizes us to recognize the truth. The, the thing is, he does exist, but he's defeated. So you don't have to worry about him. Because the one who's in you is greater than he who's in the world, even as the scripture says. Verse 5, they, meaning these false prophets, these spirits, are in the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. So if you look on National Geographic, or if you look at Newsweek, they'll talk about the real Jesus and discovering the real Jesus. And they'll come down with all of these facts and figures, and they'll try to tell you that, you know, well, Jesus was, but he really didn't say what, what he said, and he really didn't act the way he did. And, you know, these things couldn't possibly be true, and oh, the miracles, well, who could believe those? And, you know, you and I will just tilt our head like some dog whistle just blew, but they will completely accept it. And they'll tell you about Jesus and how, you know, he really didn't, you know, resurrect and, you know, they found his body or they found the real tomb of Jesus. There's always that kind of thing. And those kind of spirits are antichrist. And they will try to tear Jesus down because if you get Jesus out of the way, you could just live any old way you want to. And it's fine and good, and, you know, because there is no afterlife. There is no God. There's no accountability. There's no right and wrong. You just make it up in your own mind. That's a fable. That's as much a fable as the, the, anything else I can think of. So here's what he does. He'll say something, the, the spirit of this world, or, the, or the, these spirits of Antichrist, and there will be people that listen to you and I will sound off and we'll know it. it we, you know, something will go off in our heart and we'll figure it out. But they will listen to it. In fact, they'll get completely absorbed by it where it controls all of their senses. Like, like you're in the middle of some kind of a, a machine and you're just completely taken over. Uh, I don't know if you like video games, but there are people that play video games that get completely absorbed with this. Uh, they quit their job. They stay up all night, all day, especially with COVID. We have plenty of time to do this. And they just com get completely immersed in this thing where you can't even speak to them because they're completely gone. The people in the world will speak the language of the world and the world will believe them. Whereas we speak the truth and we start talking about Jesus and they start turning their head like a dog that's just heard a dog whistle. And that's the way it is. So, which one is the true Jesus? I wish, you know, people have been confused enough because the, the spirits have spoken enough things to confuse people. So, that is why no other religious leader has the prominence of having his name used as a curse word. You know, you don't, you don't smash your thumb with a hammer and, and, and call out the name of Buddha or Muhammad. Or, you know, it's Jesus Christ. It's always Jesus Christ used as a curse word. Why is that? Don't you, hmm. Isn't that interesting? We are of God. He knows, he who knows God hears us. And he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So you want to know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error? See what they do when you read them in Scripture. When they read the Scripture, they accept it, they understand it, they believe it, because that's the us he's referring to. He's referring to the, the apostles, the, the, the prophets who spoke the word of God to people. Um, 
that Bible that's in the middle there, that's actually Thomas Jefferson's Bible, and he was uh, a fan of pulling things out that he didn't agree with. He'd find a page he didn't agree with, he'd just tear it out. And so you'll find where he crossed out all sorts of things, too, like all of the miracles that Jesus did, completely obliterated and didn't believe them. So it's, uh, is that what you do? And you know, there are people that do it, but not that overtly. They say, oh, I believe all these nice things. You know, Jesus says, do not judge. I, I like that because I feel better. But they, they don't think about any of the other things that he ever said. So you want to have your heart ready for this, like a phacometer. You know, when somebody speaks, you want to test these spirits. And sometimes their pants are just on fire. And that's how far it is, you know, liar, liar, pants on fire. Uh, people say all sorts of things. And they're motivated by a spirit. And so you just have to understand that. There is God's spirit, and then there's another spirit. And so we want to weigh these things out. When Jesus spoke, there were people that followed him. And then there were people that didn't follow him. There were the Pharisees that came up against him, and they tried to shut him down. And it will happen to you as well. When you speak the truth to people, they may not want to hear the truth. And so they'll run away. They may do it forever. They might do it for a time. But those who hear, what, what a great and wonderful privilege it is to introduce people to Christ and to lead them to Jesus so that they might be born again. It, it is the greatest experience to have somebody's life changed before your very eyes they become a new species in Christ Jesus. And so we all learn to follow the shepherd. It's not about following any particular pastor or ism. It's about following Jesus. And that's really the bottom line. Know the truth of God's word and test the spirits. If you don't know the, the word of God, if you don't have it in your mind, in your heart, if you're not daily um, being uh, you know, strengthened by it, it's really, really hard to see sometimes. But when you know it, that meter goes off immediately when somebody says something that's false. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21 reads this way, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, Knowing this, that first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came about by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So one thing we understand is when the Scripture says something, there's no private interpretation of it. It means exactly what it means. And it's not whether you say, well, I kind of take it like this, or I kind of believe it's like that. If you look into the original language, you understand the tense of the words because it's hard. You're, you're taking a, a Hebrew language written at the time of the Greeks, who was written to these people, and now you're going to read it in English. Sometimes uh, something gets lost. So you want to keep your eyes open to understand that. But it's not given to any private interpretation. The scripture means what the scripture means, and we shouldn't play with it. So, in, in looking over what we looked at today, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist in which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. And he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So what we do to understand whether we truly are authentic, real, and founded upon the rock of who Jesus Christ is, is we do a real self-examination before God to see if we really believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And if he is, well then our entire lives should be submitted to him. If he's not, then don't waste your time. Go out and have fun and do whatever the heck it is you want to do because for eternity you'll be separated from him, so you may as well enjoy it on this side. But if not, weigh out the spirits and be careful about what you listen to. Be careful of the teachers that you hear and that you regularly watch. Be careful of the people that you allow to speak into your life because they may or may not be speaking on God's behalf. 
If they are, they'll agree with God's word. If not, they won't. And the real question is, Jesus, the Messiah, do you believe in the God-man, that he came from heaven to solve our sin problem so that you might be saved from the slavery that you live in of being in a sinful world and being a sinful person? That is the bottom line. And I pray for each one of you that might be within the hearing of my voice that you have a relationship, a conversational, daily, moment-by-moment -moment relationship that comes through the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the experience of His Spirit.